Yo, Seth Denson, thanks for coming on and doing this with me today. Nice one, Paul. Thank you, brother. Nice for the invitation. Yeah, yeah. So, for anyone watching who doesn't know who Seth Denson is, he's um, a bit of a legend on the Manchester hip hop scene and has been for a long time. Um, you you want to come? You, I first heard of you, Seth Denson. You won a competition. Was that like in the late 80s? It was around 80, it just was at the end of 87, I think, beginning, the beginning of 88. Um, it actually wasn't, it wasn't, I didn't win the competition. It was, it was Prince Cool that won the competition. Yeah. Um, and he got the golden mic, but because I was, all, all the, all the participants at the time were all using backing, backing records and tracks on the stage. It was at the Hippodrome in London. Um, and all of the performers were using vinyl and, um, Prince Cool's, Prince Cool's gimmick was me. I was beatboxing for him. I was his backing. So there was a bit of controversy with it, with people like MC Tunes, a few other people. They were yeah, like, yeah. I if, he you, if, he, if he didn't have you, you know, he wouldn't have won it. But yeah, of course, he won it for his skills. But yeah, I'd, I, we won the competition um, and we both got golden microphones from Shaw. At the time, they were like probably one of the best microphones on the on the planet and they, they gave me a golden microphone. I performed and um, blew the crowd away to the point where they wanted me to come back out just on my own and do a little five minute thing, which is uh, on one of the DMC videos, you can see me doing doing my thing. But yeah, I was about, I was 15, I think at the time. <laughs> yeah. Can I remember when I, I used to buy hip hop, I uh, used to say it with dinner when he at school and buy inputs from yeah. spinning. And then it was like, you and Leaky Fresh, yeah, and um, I f Kermit's band. What about Kermit? I forgot the name of him now. Ruthless Rap Assassin. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. To be fair, there was a very big, there was a very big um, hip hop community in Manchester. You know, a lot of rappers rap took off quite early in Manchester. Funny you should mention Kermit because Kermit was probably the first first person to make a rap record with Greg Wilson that came out on um, came out on uh, what's his name and on the Street Sounds label. Uh, Morgan Khan, they released their first record. You know when the electro the electro albums were coming out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They did a UK one, and Kermit, Kermit, and Greg did a track on that. Did a well, it was a, pro probably a quite a lot of Manchester based um, uh, music on that first album. And um, yeah, Kermit, Kermit was on that, bro. So he's he's got deep roots in hip hop in Manchester, um, and then obviously. The Ruthless Rap Assassins came along. You had MC Tunes, you know. Um, wow, there was just a, there was just a massive, massive influx of of hip hop being recorded um, out of Manchester. You know, Johnny J. Rock, the House Prince, Cool, um, MC Busby. You know, there was a lot, a lot of people doing their thing at that time. And then house music took over, really, didn't it? Like it, it was massive. Yeah. It, it, it incorporated, you had hip house, you know, which was still, it was house music with rappers on it and stuff. Hacienda came along, Ecstasy came along, um, changed the tempo of people wanting to dance, you know, so obviously we had our, we had our big rap anthems that still got played in the Hacienda, Mantronics, things like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah, it was, it, it, it took a, it took a change, it took a change, the whole scene took a change, you know, hip hop. Kind of fizzled out. Breaking wasn't really going on anymore. Breakdance had ended, um, so that was one element of hip hop that kind of that went. But, uh, you know, people trans people transform and evolve into other things. I mean, people like MC Tunes, he still rapped and shine. They still rapped, but kind of incorporated it with more dance dance element of music. Yeah. So you you uh, I, I mate Kenzie as well. Like I used to go to school with him, and. Um, yeah. You've kept it going, haven't you? You've stayed loyal. And I was reading about you the other day and you did an event and about 3,000 people came to it. Yeah, I mean, that what you're probably talking about is the Hip Hop Summer Jams, what I was doing in Berlin, yeah. Berlin, yeah. Berlin Sports Club. We actually got 7,000 people. Um, wow. And the second one was even bigger um, during the course of the day, but sadly it rained, so it was like, sporadic in and out people coming spending a few hours going but if we would have had a the, 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 like the first year we did it it was like a day from bloody south of france or spain or something it was about 80 degrees outside everybody had 
the shirts off. It was just beautiful. The weather was great. So we had we, we had people stay all day, which I mean, if we would have had that on the second event, we would have probably had about numbers of about eight to ten thousand people. Wow, that's that's amazing. So I've been filming conversations around men and mental health. Yeah. Uh, what's your experience of mental health? Um I think it's probably the number one, which would really be depression. Um, yeah. It, it, it stemmed from probably being at an early stage in life where, you know, you're up and out there and you're doing your thing. And I was touring the world at a very young age. I was involved with the music scene. I was kind of friends with most of the people that are now regarded as super DJs, you know, Carl Cox's and, and um, you know, uh, all those guys from the Spectrum era and, you know, guys, um, my, name, my memory is kind of a bit, a bit short. Yeah. But I remember meeting most of those guys with the DMC team because they used to be in my management. Um, Paul Oakenfold, uh, Dave Seaman, you know, these guys went on, Paul DeCain, Chad Jackson, you know, they were, they were, they were, they were, they were, you know, mega DJs then, but then obviously went on to the B for scene and big house productions and you know stuff like that so yeah i mean being in that kind of environment and circle at such a young age and the world kind of at your feet and you know being praised as this this kind of like mega kid or whatever you know like a superstar at the time it was kind of it felt like being a superstar when you're on stage and you're getting a lot of attention media attention etc and then when that kind of fizzles out and comes to an end you know, you lose bearings, don't you? And you don't know kind of what's the next stage to take in life. So I kind of think depression hit then at a young age, probably about 17, um, you know, just trying to find find the next thing, what to do. Um, Were you I, only 17 then when you won that competition and then... Well, I was 15. I was 15 then and went on a world tour for two years with um, Chad Jackson and then with the yeah. DMC world touring team, which was me, myself, DJ Pogo, Cutmaster Swift and uh, MC Fresh J. So, yeah, it was um, it was it was it was kind of um, it was a bit of a an anticlimax when all that came to an end. And then you're just finding yourself with nothing to do, no, no touring, no going around the world. You know what I mean? It was a. It was a bit of a strange one. So having to deal with that was was pretty uh, it was pretty difficult, I would, I would imagine, because I was in a circle at that time, even though I was quite young, but I was I was partying a lot, drinking, you know, taking drugs, getting on it. Yeah. Yeah. Um so probably that had a little bit of bearing to it as well, you know, the chemical imbalance. Sounds like a massive come down to have all that adulation and fame and, and then and then yeah it's, it's out of the realms of like most people's comprehension that isn't it because not a, not many of us get famous do we and then to get it and then to, to slowly lose to, it, to it lose it yeah of course and I, and, and I think that kind of that had a lot of bearing on it you know at the, at the first stage like just a loss a loss of well, not loss of purpose, but it felt that way, I would imagine, looking back in reflection. Yeah. Did you um, did you ever get diagnosed with depression? Or was no, it just I mean, it's, felt... it's nothing. I've never really, I'm, and as an adult, obviously, I've gone through stages of depression, but I've never gone for professional help on, on, on any of it. Do you know what I mean? I've just kind of, like, dealt with it, self-medicated myself, really, to be honest. Yeah. Is that like alcohol and weed? Yeah, everything, you know. When I was, like, say, in the 90s, 95, when I was DJing at Sefton Madface um, and doing a lot of radio and a lot of gigs and DJing all over the place, weed was the thing, you know. I was smoking, you know, lots of weed daily. Um, I was probably most of the period of that, of that era I was high, so... You know, when people say, oh, yeah, I remember that night you were playing it, or I remember when you was doing that, I just don't recall much of it, you know what I mean? It's like a bit of a yeah. blur, that air. But, um, you know, it, it's what we all went through, especially with the culture. I was chatting to Tintin yesterday, and I'm probably going to upload that today, and then we were talking about, like, a, a lot of people did 
pills and stuff in Manchester in, in the 90s, didn't they? And, and um, you don't think you're ever going to get old, do you? I'm like, I'm 51 now. Yeah. And I'm finding that I'm more comfortable in myself and I know what I want more. And it took me a long time to realise that like alcohol and drugs weren't good for me. And I got right. sick of the come downs. And, and um, yeah, eventually you get yourself to a more comfortable place, don't you? Yeah, of course. I mean, I'm, well, we're the same age. I'm 51 in March. Um, you know, you, 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 you learn how to control the intake of whatever it is, whether it's drink or drugs. You know, some people don't, but, you know, don't get me wrong. I, d I don't, I'm not one of those who's, I don't drink, I don't take this, I don't take that. I do it in moderation and I do it when it's according, you know, like I'll we go for dinner and I'll have a glass of wine or a couple of beers with the lads when we go out. But uh, obviously, you know, some people can't do that. You know, they, they don't have that coping mechanism. They can't differentiate between having one drink or having a hundred drinks. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's, that's yeah. a sad thing with some people with um, drug or alcohol dependency. Uh, do you find me working in the music industry, especially like being who you are, like uh, a well-known face in Manchester, you're expected to be confident all the time? Yeah, pressure. I mean, it kind of went that way when 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 I was when I was experimenting with other chemicals, you know, more the more the kind of like the synthetic drugs, the cocaine or or ecstasy or things like that, MDMA. You know, that's more of in a party environment, and then you realise that you do you do you take it prior to a night out or in company, as a, as you say, as a confidence kind of like booster. You know, some people need it to stay confident. If they don't take it, they won't come out of the house or they won't go somewhere, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And are you still doing music now? I'm still involved with music, yeah. I mean, I've not produced any music for a long time. I was doing a lot of uh, music production with um, with a guy called Dave Jones, who's um, said bias when, when the UK garage scene first came along. Um, I kind of morphed from hip-hop into garage. Um, I never knew that. I love garage. Yeah, uh, yeah. I was recording at the time on um on Locked On Records. I had a, I had oh, a yeah. record with Locked On. Then um I had an album deal with Hospital Records, which was like a drum and bass label. Um, um yeah, I put out some stuff with with Zed and we were doing um all the early two step, which was kind of like falling into the same category at the time as as dubstep and grime and stuff. It was kind of like the early birth of that gear. It was a little bit harder than, you know, Garage, UK Garage. We were a bit more darker. We had the, the elements of um, of, of uh, kind of like hip hop, but also deep, dark chords and jazz and heavy bass lines. So it was very, it was a bit darker than the usual kind of Garage that was coming out, you know, like all that champagne, girly, nice kind of stuff we were playing about with, with dark samples and taking people to another energy. But recording sessions, you know, mate, just smoke, smoke copious amounts of weed and, yeah. <laughs> and whatever else is going on, you know, a couple of bottles of fucking vodka or whatever while you're just making, being a creative, do you know what I mean? Because it got to that stage where you think, you know, I can become a creative on weed. I'd get that way. I'd just smoke rolls and rolls of weed and just, just lock myself in the studio. You, you know, you forget, like, how, how big that late 80s hip-hop and house scene a Manchester band scene got around the world. I was watching a YouTube channel recently and it's, um, I think it's called The New Dance Show and it's a dance show in Detroit in the eight, late 80s. And uh, it's all like, it, it's awesome. It's, it's in a, it looks a bit cheesy, some of it, because it's in a dance club and it's paid dances, yeah. but it's all like Techno Model 500. And, and um, okay. I, I didn't realise how big a guy called Gerald was. Yeah, Gerald, man, Gerald, he grew up around us, you know, we all grew up in the same community and I used to go to Gerald's when we were younger and um, he had a lot of equipment, you know what I mean, Gerald was very experimental and he was always exploring with new new gadgets, you know, he'd have like 303 and bait and acid, acid machines and stuff, he had a lot of, he had a lot of technology back then, he was creative. Um, he mastered obviously the 808 and then did the stuff with uh, 808 State you know he did a lot of the production for those guys because um, he knew how to use the equipment yeah I mean 
Gerald is massive, man. He lives. He was living in Germany. I think he's back in London now. But you know, he's got he's got a mega name on the techno scene, on the house scene. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Rita Ray was a you know an anthem. I was surprised at Blow Your House Down because that's on on a few of the clips, and then you look at the comments, and that was people's favorite dance techno track in Detroit. And I read it. And I thought, wow, we we imported it back to them. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I mean. To be honest, there was no face to house music, you know, so it wasn't like trying to infiltrate the rap scene back in the day where it was a predominantly American culture um, and rapping in an American accent or trying to discuss American subject matters or, you know, trying to emulate their formula. We wasn't really accepted. It took a long time for hip hop to get accepted by America, whereas dance music is kind of faceless. You know, you put a track out, you don't know where it's produced, whether it's produced in Sheffield, you know, or London yeah. or Manchester. So you can listen to you can listen to stuff that came out of Sheffield on Warp, and you know, play that now or play it in the in the techno clubs, and 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 people would go crazy for it. You know, they didn't know it was a UK record. I am um, friends. You'll know Red Fan, won't you? Um, yeah, Mickey's a good. Yeah, friend. Mickey. Yeah, uh, he, he, uh, I surprised Donald D comes over to Manchester a lot, doesn't it? Yeah, well, I put Donald D on a show when I owned a nightclub in Manchester called Club Night 4. How oh, did Donald... you own that? Yeah, yeah. We had um, Donald D and um, Lonel, jo Lonel, Lonel something, I can't remember his surname, but he's a rapper from Sweden, American kid who went to Sweden, and he was part of part of their team. So he came over with him. Um, and yeah, they did a, they did an awesome performance. You know, Donald um, Donald D, obviously, you know, early New York hip hop kid. Um, yeah, the big yeah. boys. You know, he's he mega. And yeah. Then he, and then he got hooked up with Ice T, became part of the syndicate. So it was it was it's really nice to kind of. I mean, to be honest, a lot of the old school American rappers now they're very very approachable and they all want to work with UK rap you know they're still trying to rekindle careers and they're up for coming over to the UK and, and doing recording sessions you know people like YZ, um, Ant Live, you know Chuck D, there's a lot of kids who are still flying and out of England working with with production companies and people who are making music. Yeah Public Enemy they, they really they were really different weren't they at the time they were, they were political um, weren't they? Revolutionaries, man. They, they yeah, changed yeah, the whole yeah. thing, you know. They made they made a lot of crossover with hip hop. When you know hip hop was going in one direction, they just brought it all back together again, you know, with the message and also the sound that the, the bomb squad was creating. It was just like phenomenal. You couldn't touch that Def Jam stuff at the time. So have you um you live in Spain now? I moved to Spain, yeah. I'm living in Spain now. Um been here for a little while. Um but yeah, it's uh, just a bit more of a chilled lifestyle for me now. But I still, yeah. I still keep obviously I work remotely with my UK businesses, and I like to keep keep doing what I'm doing with the UK scene. I'm still um, working with closely with Unity Radio, um, yeah. John Green, people like that, and we're doing. It's funny we know this this whole topic we're discussing is mental health, but I'm currently organising. Um, some 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 really good courses with them that involve males and females who are suffering with mental health. We do a five day course which gives them teaches them how to you know broadcast their own radio show and then they deliver it on the fifth day. Um, and it's just basically a really good bonding, a, a bonding kind of like um, project, and it involves a, a company called Coof. Um, which and Quell, which are, are massive with the on the mental health scene, helping out you know young people. They work in schools and stuff. Um, but this particular project we do is for like over twenty ones. So we're trying to incorporate old school people. Like this last one I just did had um, four pioneers. So we have Mickey Red Venom, um, Paul Gatter, um, DJ Pressure, yeah. and Lady Livefire. So they were kind of like an older head to, you know, incorporate with the younger ones so they could give a bit more of life experience and, and, and kind of like steer and guide them and give them a little bit of insight into their lives and what, what they've gone through and how they've coped with mental health. Yeah. 
that sounds amazing. Um, I just like, um, yeah, re really glad that you've come on and done this with me. Um, I'd just like to end it real with what advice would you give anyone watching for mental health? Um, you know, mental health is, is, it's a wide, it's a wide spectrum of things. You know what I mean? Some people have to have medication. Some people, as I said earlier on in the interview, self-medicate. Um, I find walking, going outdoors, you know, being, doing my mountain walks or, or spending out, outdoor time, um, helps me, you know, or listening to music, making music creative. You know, that's kind of like how I am. Um, it's how I self-medicate. But obviously you've got you've got deeper, you've got deeper situations for some people who have to kind of get professional help. Um, and I wouldn't what I would advise is don't be ashamed of it. You know, if there is something you're going through and you know, it's you know, you know, it's affecting you. There's, there are plenty of organizations out there that can help along the way, Kuth being probably one of the best um, for, for me anyway, who I've kind of like spoken with and addressed my issues with. Um, so I would, I would highly recommend that if that was the case. You're an absolute legend. I'm just gonna stop recording now. Um, so thanks, thanks so much for, for doing this with me. No problem.